All right, are you encouraged by that? I'll tell you what, if you, if you want to make a pastor feel inadequate, talk him into doing a series on the book of Revelation. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, but the one thing I am becoming convinced of, I, I, I was convinced before, but even more convinced now, that God indeed does have the whole world in his hands. He has the whole situation figured out, and it's going along according to his plan. And as long as we know that we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we are among those who are sealed until the day of redemption, regardless of what goes on on, on this earth, even if it is these uh, wild horses with crazy horsemen on them and uh, mayhem and all that going on all around us, we're okay because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're God's people, and he loses none of his people. That's good news for us. So how do we preach this, though? How, how do we deal with these sorts of chapters? You, you, you remember we, we've gone through this, and we've had, we've had trumpets, and now we've got seals, and, and we're going to move on to bowls or vials, depending on uh, the translation you have. Uh, what does all this mean to us? Now, and what did it mean, remember we always have to ask, what did it mean to those churches in the first century when the book was written? What, what, what could all this stuff mean? We have some contemporary theologians, I won't mention their names, uh, that uh, they read this and they interpret it. They have some books out, you can read them if you, if you have nothing better to do. And, and they look at these horses and things and they come up with helicopters and missiles and gunships and usually end up with nuclear configuration and all that sort of thing. Well, is that what God intended when he wrote this? I don't think so. That would have had absolutely no meaning for the folks that were alive in those days, would it? And this letter was sent to the churches, right? The seven churches specifically. But it's, it's, not, uh, it's just not a good thing to look around in our world and then interpret scripture according to what we see. Let me give you an example. Uh, the, the, the theological thought that the folks that try to identify all these things uh, actually originated in the late 19th century and it became very popular as time went on. And, but here's the problem with all that. In 1870, a guy by the name of the Reverend J.L. Martin wrote a book, a commentary on the book of Revelation. The title of the book was The Seven Thunders. Now I told you early on we'd get to The Seven Thunders and we will, but not just yet. But The Seven Thunders, and in The Seven Thunders he identified who these horses and their riders are. And here is who they are. Let me give you a little context. The big news in the country at the time was General Sherman was engaged in a campaign against the Sioux Indians. Okay, the repeating rifle, the good old Winchester, was fairly new. That was the latest and greatest weapon of mass destruction in the day, was the lever action repeating rifle. So these horses and these men, you know, it says with heads like lions. Well, that was because uh, what, what the, the cavalry would do when they charged the Indians, you'd, you'd lean over the horse like this and your rifle over here. And the manes of the horses are, looked like the manes of a lion on the guy's faces. So anyway, he identified them as, as uh, the cavalry troops charging the Indians. Is that who they're supposed to be? I don't think so. And, and if the Lord tarries another hundred or another thousand years, and, and if they're still using that same sort of interpretation, uh, they will come up with new things. They will be spaceships or whatever they are. I don't know. But that's not a good way to go about it. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to fall into that trap. Now there are things that should catch our attention. There are things that, that give us some clues uh, about what's going on, but we will get to those. Now these folks that severely misinterpret this book are Christians, they're well-meaning, they're just wrong, okay? In my opinion. 
So, but if they're wrong in how they interpret the book, how do we avoid falling into the same trap? Because it is tempting, isn't it? I mean, don't we want to identify all these things and know what they are? I do. I think it's a, it, it's a temptation because that's the way we think. We, we don't like mystery. We don't like ambiguity. We want to know what these things are. So we avoid it like this. By remembering the purpose of the book, which is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Right? And what does it say? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ to the churches through John. So, the purpose of this book isn't to identify all these things. It's for us to get a better idea of who Jesus Christ is. It's the revelation of Him throughout history to us. And then we have to remind ourselves, what is the theme of this book? And the theme is that God rules history and will bring it to a triumphant climax in Jesus Christ. If you, you read the book, if you take the whole panorama of the book, what happens? We start here and we have all this chaos and God interacting and things going on and people being sealed and saved and people being destroyed and condemned. But the end is, when we get to the last couple of chapters, it'll all be easy to preach because it's all good. It's all heaven. And it's all us being there in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe I'll just skip ahead. <laughs> no, we can't do that. So, we need to remember also, as we've talked along the way, that this book, the book of Revelation, is deeply rooted in Old Testament imagery. Now, the first century church would be very familiar with that Old Testament imagery, and they would be much quicker to pick up on it than we are. It is also presented to us, not in a linear fashion, but in a series of cycles. Hopefully you, you've been able to pick up on that. Now, where, where in the Old Testament do we see this same thing? Well, the, the number one place we would go would be the book of Judges. And if you're familiar with the book of Judges, there are seven cycles in that book. And, and the cycles go like this. God's with, dealing with God's people. There's apostasy. There's oppression. There's deliverance. And there's restoration. And then we have another cycle and another cycle as you go through. And so we have in Revelation, we have a cycle with the trumpets, we have a cycle with the seals, we have a cycle uh, with the bowls and the vials. But another thing that, that gives us trouble, and I know this is review, but it's good for us to review from time to time, is they use all this phenomenological language. And, and it's, again, it's hard for us because they talk about, you know, crazy things like the sky splitting open and the stars falling from the sky and over and over again. and It's kind of overwhelming sometimes. Another thing uh, it does is it uses personification, which just simply means you take an object, an inanimate object, and you ascribe to it human features. Now, this is the, because this is the genre of the literature. This is apocalyptic literature. And we, we struggle with it here sometimes in the book of Revelation. But it's interesting to me, when we're in, say, the book of Psalms or some of these other books where poetic language is very similar to apocalyptic language, we don't struggle with it. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 55, verse 12, uh, the prophet says that there's going to come a time uh, when the hills will sing with joy and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now, I don't know of a single Christian that has ever set out to find those trees that are clapping their hands. See? Because we know intuitively what, they're, what the author's talking about, don't we? Well, apocalyptic language is the same way. There are a lot of these things that are simply that. And let me give you a tip on, on so, something that could really be helpful to you, I think. Yeah, I don't know, you may or may not be familiar with R.C. Sproul. He's one of my favorite contemporary theologians. And he has a program, it's on our local station, uh, KPDQ, I guess it is, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, if that's not convenient for you, that's okay because we've got these things called cell phones that I know you all have turned off. Everybody's checking now. <laughs> no. 
But you can listen to him on your cell phone. I, I've, I've, I listen to him at the gym, and it's, it's great. You can lift weights and listen to R.C. Sproul. But he's been doing a series lately on just how to interpret the Bible. And it's a great series. So if, if you'd like to, li to listen to it, just uh, Google Ligonier Ministries, and it's spelled L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R, and then go to where it says Renewing Your Mind, that's the radio ministry, and you'll get it. And if you don't, have to, if you don't want to listen to him regularly or, or that, listen to this month, the 17th and the 18th. Those two broadcasts are especially pertinent to what we've been talking about, and I think they will help you. Now, they're always helpful to me, anyway, and, and I need all the help I can get. So I think you will enjoy those. But anyway, let's get on with what we're talking about today. Verses 13 through 15. Let me reread those for you. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Wow. Well, we, we kind of... A third of mankind... But we don't want to get focused there. Let's see how we get there. Let's see what precedes that. So the first thing we see here when he opens up is where this angel is. And where is it? In the throne room of God. So God is the one that is orchestrating all this. So those of us who know him know that we're okay. It's going to be all right. He says, release this angels, these angels. Where have we seen these angels before? Remember back in chapter 7, when we were going through the trumpets, there were four angels, but God said at that time to hold those angels and not to let them do what he, they were going to do. Remember? You can go back and read that for yourself in chapter 7. So now we see these angels again, and God's going to release them. So what we're seeing is another return back to where we started. And, and it's kind of confusing, but here's what came to my mind as I was trying to think of how to explain this to you, these seals and, and cycles and things, is think about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you read Matthew from start to finish, it always ends up at the cross, doesn't it? And the resurrection. So then you read Mark, so where does Mark start? He comes back here and jumps into where Matthew started and, and goes again and ends up where? At the cross and the resurrection. And then you go to Luke and it does the same thing, doesn't it? Comes back and starts towards the beginning of Christ's life and goes all the way through and ends up with the cross and the resurrection. Now when we approach those Gospels, for some reason, we, we don't try to interpret them linearly. Okay, this is what happened in Matthew, then Mark picks up at the end of Matthew and goes on. Do, we don't do that, do we? We know that it's going back. Well, that's what it is with these uh, trumpets. They went along, and then we come to the seals, they go back over here, they go along, and we'll come to the, the vials, they'll come back over here, and they'll go along, and they all end up with the great day of judgment. A very sorrowful day for those who are without Christ, but a very triumphant day for those that are with Christ. In verse 15, we see the release of these angels. But we see that it is, it, it, it's not that they're released at some time. It's that they're released at a very precise time. Notice it says that they're released the angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. So what he's trying to say to us is, there is a very precise time when this will happen. Now he doesn't tell us when that is, but he tells us enough that we should be able to know that he's got this all under control. It's God that's ruling and reigning. And we don't have to be concerned with it. What we need to know is, that as we approach the end of time, the prayers of the martyrs are being answered. You remember the martyrs back when we did the trumpets? And what was it the martyrs were crying out to the Lord for? They said, how long, O Lord, until you avenge us? 
Well, here it is. God is avenging them. And that's what these horses are going to be doing. There will be a day of reckoning. You remember back in chapter 6, as we ended up with the last trumpet, what happened? Verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come. Okay. So that was the end according to the trumpet scenarios. Now we're reaching it according uh, to the seals. Now one more thing about the setting here, and we see it here, it talks about the Euphrates River. Well now, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. I don't think. We, we don't have a lot of ideas. But, it had great biblical significance and also great significance to those people living in the Roman Empire uh, in that time. Let, let me uh, give you an example. The, the Euphrates River, bad things always came from across the Euphrates River. You remember the divided kingdom, Israel and Judah? You remember the Assyrians came and wiped out Israel? Where did the Assyrians come from? The eastern side of the Euphrates River. The Babylonians come along a little later, uh, take out Judah. Where did the Babylonians come from? The eastern side of the Euphrates River. Uh, when they took Daniel and the, the other folks back to captivity, where did they take them? To the other side of the Euphrates River. And, and what's over there now? Iran, Afghanistan, Turkey, those places. So, biblically speaking, and these people would have had pretty good biblical knowledge, anything coming across the Euphrates River was bad news. Well, what about the secular world, the contemporary world? What would the Euphrates River have meant to them? Well, the Euphrates River was the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. Okay. That was the extent of their control. Now, they dabbled around over there a little bit. and In fact, uh, they were kind of sunk into this morass of a, uh, an ongoing uh, on-again, off-again war with the Parthian Empire that ran from the 60s BC to about the 3rd century AD. And they were always fighting back and forth. And it's interesting to me that it drained the empire. This constant fighting with these people on the east, other side of the Euphrates River. It weakened them and drained them. But before that happened, one of the biggest defeats the Roman legions ever suffered was on the other side of the Euphrates River. Now what happened was, you remember last week I told you we were going to talk about the richest man in Rome this week a little bit. And some of you looked it up. And unfortunately some of you looked it up while I was preaching. Imagine. <laughs> but anyway, the, the richest man in the Roman Empire was a guy by the name of Crassus. And uh, well, the, the, the Roman Empire was in the process of going from a republic uh, to becoming a, a, a monarchy. And uh, it was room by, ruled by a thing called a triumvirate. The first triumvirate. There were, three of, there were two of them, excuse me. But anyway, triumvirate, as it implies, was made up of three men. And the first triumvirate was made up of uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Pompey the Great, and Crassus. And Crassus was the richest man in Rome. Now, we talked a little bit about some of the plagues that are on the earth today. And a couple of them were greed and pride. Right? You remember we talked about that? Well, unfortunately... Crassus had a big dose of both of those. Because here's the deal. While Crassus is the richest man in Rome, Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, Pompey conquered several other territories. So they were revered and respected as great generals. And in, in Rome, in that culture, there was nothing more exalted than being a great general. Well, Crassus, he was regarded as, eh, he's the guy that stayed home and made all the money, while these other guys were out went in the war. So he really wanted two things. He wanted more money because he didn't have enough and he wanted to be right up there. He wanted his, his pride wanted him to be known as a great general. So here's what he does. He gets seven legions and he goes across the Euphrates and he's gonna go to war with Parthia. That whole area that we call Iran, etc., etc., was just Parthia in those days. So he goes across there and he takes these seven legions with him. 
and he encounters the Parthians. Well, it was the biggest, one of the biggest defeats the Romans ever had. The Romans lost 30,000 men in one day, and the Parthians lost 1,000. Why? Because greed, ambition, pride, all those things. So, the regular folks were always sort of on edge. When are the Parthians going to come across the river? Now see, what the Parthians had is they had cavalry. That was their thing. They had hardly no infantry. So if you picture this in the desert, here come the legions. Now they had some cavalry, but mostly infantry and heavy infantry. And what would happen is the Parthians with their, their, their horses and their great archers, and they would just come around as just a fast cavalry charge and circle the, the Roman square so to, and just pick them to pieces with their arrows. And then they had another thing they did, and it's called the Parthian shot. Anybody ever, you ever hear that phrase? And what they would do is they would come in on their horses, and then the legions would try to come at them, and they would turn around like they were going to run, and then turn around and shoot over the backs of their horses. And so they could shoot coming and going. Anyway, it's called the Parthian shot in history, if you ever want to know anything about that. But anyway, Everybody that lived in the area, whether for a biblical reason or for strictly a uh, contemporary reason, would be worried about people coming from the other side of the Euphrates. So, where do these horsemen come from? The other side of the Euphrates. Wow. It's amazing. So what about the vision here that he's seeing? Let's move on here in 16 through 19. The number of mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision. Now let's stop there for a minute. A vision. What is a vision? It's a dream-like thing, isn't it? So he's, he's kind of, he's seeing these things in a sort of a dream-like way. Now, I don't know if your dreams are anything like mine, but mine are goofy. They never make sense. You know, you jump from this to that, and it's just crazy stuff. And, well, that's what John's seeing here is a vision. And it doesn't all make sense to him. Second, most of John's attention is to the horses with just a, a cursory mention of the riders and there the, are these breastplates sulfur and smoke and that what's that all about wouldn't you think he'd pay more attention to the riders because uh, the rider directs the horse doesn't he hopefully but he pays all this attention to the horses what could this be what could it represent I think it represents the same thing we saw back with the trumpets, a demonic plague on the earth. Because there are no horses that look like this. You ever see a horse with a serpent for a tail? No. No. It is God sending these creatures, they're spiritual creatures now, they're not flesh and bone creatures, sending these creatures to exact vengeance for the saints who have been killed in his name. The breastplates and the horses. The horses are breathing what? Fire, smoke, and what? Sulfur. What does that connote to us? The, the pit? Hell? Yeah, I, I think John is relaying to us that there's going to be a hell on earth scenario. Put simply. As I said, these are not flesh and blood horses. They are John's attempt to convey to us the horror and the ugliness of the demonic world. And it does certainly exist. They don't kill directly but by spreading hate and discontent throughout the earth. By throwing the world into chaos and lawlessness. And don't we see that today? Sure we do. Did they see that then in the first century? Sure they did. 
Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 24 when the, the disciples asked him when the end would be, he said that uh, you're always going to have wars and rumors of wars and these things will always be with you. So, what I think God is saying to us is, though we live in stressful times, everybody lived in stressful times. Don't be concerned. Be involved, be good citizens, do your part, do what you can, but don't be distressed. Don't be disheartened. Don't ever get to the place where you think God doesn't have it all under control. Because He does. As we saw with the seals, this intensifies as we approach the end. And, and that's hard because we go through and we get to the end, then we go back and we go through and we get to the end. You remember in Revelation 6, verse 17, for the great day of the wrath has come, and the question was, who can stand? And you remember that at that point, we took a little interlude, and God moved the action to heaven, and we, we got to see who could stand. And all those who had been sealed were standing in heaven. Remember the, the great multitude, the innumerable, innumerable multitude. Well, that's part of us. So who can stand before the great day of the Lord? You and I. If we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's who can stand. Finally, verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. You remember back in chapter 6 again? They knew where judgment was coming from. They knew God was judging them. They knew the hills were going to fall, or they called for the hills to fall. Rather than repent, they tried to hide. Same thing here. Rather than repent, they clung to their idols. They clung to the things they worshipped that are of no value. And we see humanity doing the same thing today. We see men and women who confronted with the gospel, who are confronted with the opportunity to have eternal life, and they say, no, I'm too busy. I'm too attached to this thing. I don't want to give up that thing. I enjoy this sin too much. You know, and we oftentimes, when we think of sin, you know, we think of terrible stuff, but sin is fun. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be a problem. Sin sometimes can feel really good. That's why it's a problem. The trouble is, the good feeling, the good feedback we get from sin is only temporary. It's only temporal. Even if we indulge in it till the day we die, it still ends on the day we die. And the good feedback ends. And we step into an eternity without Christ. So these people would not turn from their sins. Still they did not repent. Here in chapter 9, they stubbornly refused to turn from their idols to a God who offers restoration, forgiveness, Hmm. So the question is, what about you? What if the great and terrible day of the Lord were to come this afternoon? What would it be for you? Would it be a time of terror and heart sickness that you had refused to embrace the God who loves you so much he sent his son to die on the cross for you? Or would it be a great day of rejoicing because you are there with him? The family is now united for the greatest family reunion ever. We all have that choice to make. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to the family reunion. And Cousin Eddie won't be there. It's all going to be good. 
And if you don't know him, you're not going. And all the enjoyment, all the things you thought you wanted are going to pale. So I would just encourage you, Christians, don't worry about it. It's all good. It all ends good for us. That's what this book tells us. If you're not a Christian, I would encourage you to take this moment in time and just bow your head with me here in a minute and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And at that moment, you step into the kingdom of God never to be cast out. That's quite a deal. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And Lord, I admit I don't understand it all. I don't think I even understand hardly any of it. And yet one day we're going to step into eternity and we will understand it all then. We'll be able to see and we'll be able to say, wow, how did I miss that? But the one thing I do understand is there's only one way to heaven and that's through you, Jesus Christ. And so I would just... Uh, Ask, Lord, that if there be anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, they just take this time to simply say in the quietness of their hearts, Lord, we want you to be our Savior. And know that it's done. That they are now sons or daughters of the great living God. And it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we'll never make any more mistakes. It means that we are forgiven. That we are washed clean. That we now have new life eternal life through you, Jesus Christ our Lord. For that we are forever grateful. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.